welcome back to another video for the All Black fan page here on YouTube. It's your boy Max, hosting the channel, and today, it's probably going to be a wee bit longer of a video, but man, oh man, is it going to be worth it. Today we're going to be talking about what went wrong for New Zealand rugby between the 2015 World Cup and the 2019 World Cup loss to England in the semi-final, which is very painful for us all to hear about. So, first off I'm going to circle back to 2004, which was Sir Graham Henry's first year in charge of the All Blacks. He began to make Dan Carter, Richie McCaw, Kevin Mialamu, Many great names you'll remember who were kept by John Mitchell, regular starters. All of these guys were kept by John Mitchell, but it wasn't until Graham Henry came along that they began to become world-class players. Although they lost the 2007 World Cup, New Zealand rugby decided to change its mind and they began to adopt a theme of continuity, but I think the continuity experiment has run its course and they need to run a continuity experiment with a new set of coaches to continue with. In 2011, Ted led us to win the 2011 World Cup. He was an amazing coach, and this was a great way for him to leave his term, rather, as New Zealand Rugby's head coach of the All Blacks. He then handed over the reins to Steve Hansen, as you all know, and the issue with Shag, I think, was that he was a wee bit stubborn, so it came to bite him in the back long term. Ted capped some of the greatest athletes to ever walk the face of the earth. He kept Samuel Whitelock, Sonny Bill Williams. He kept Israel Dagg, Ben Smith, Conrad Smith. Man, the list could go on. It's just phenomenal. It's incredible. Graham Henry just did an amazing job for New Zealand rugby, and because so many of those players continues to play in Shag's reign as the all-black coach, it was easy for them to win in 2015, except for that semi-final against South Africa. They walked over the Wallabies in the 2015 World Cup final. Ben Franks was on the bench. Bowden Barrett was on the bench. Kevin Mialamu was on the bench. Brody Vitalik was amazing. Dan Carter was amazing. Julian Savia, the greatest rugby player of all time, was amazing. Unfortunately, as a lot of these players began to retire, Shag's win percentage started to get worse. I'm not going to personally attack Ian Foster, as a lot of you thought I might. I think a lot of it has to do with the players as well as the coaches. Like, I'm sure, like Shag had the best talent pool to pick from the history of the planet, but with a lot of these greats heading out, it just wasn't going to work for a third time in a row. It especially wasn't going to work because we were coming up against Eddie Jones, who is the master of exploiting people's faults, I'll say. I don't want to swear here. Anyway, everything was going pretty well into 2016. A lot of people feared that the post McCaw era would feature a lot of losses and we just couldn't be the same team. But it just wasn't true. Under the leadership of Ben Smith and Kieran Reid, the team continues to be the stock standard All Blacks who always win that we all know them as. Aaron Cruden was starting off at the 10, Aaron Smith continued into his job, Brody Vitalik and Sam Whitelock still the dominant locking combo, Izzy Dagg was back on the wing, Julian Savia continued to break records, but in the later days of that year, Ireland played against us in Chicago, and they were really able to exploit a yellow card to Joe Moody after he made a pretty bad spear tackle. I believe they scored three tries in the space of the 10 minutes Moody was off for, and we just never managed to make back to that margin we were losing by. TJ Pitanara came off the bench that day and made an instant impact, as did Scott Barrett, but a late try to Robbie Henshaw just sealed the deal for Ireland, and that day it really exposed our lack of depth at lock, it exposed our lack of ability to win a game without dominating, and it exposed our lack of ability to deal with a rush defence coaching system that was implemented by current Ireland coach Andy Farrell. Andy Farrell was also the defence coach for the British and Irish Lions team in 2017, and because of this tactic, they were really able to rattle the minds of the All Blacks, and they were really able to deal some serious damage to the ego of a lot of the outgoing players, such as Cruden and Charlie Farmawina. 
I know that a lot of people like to blame the 2017 Lions series on the red card to Sonny Bill Williams, and they like to blame it on the fact that Jerome Garcia didn't pick up on a late penalty by Ken Owens that could have led Bowden Barrett to kick us to victory. But actually, I'm going to circle back a wee bit, and I'm not going to blame Williams, because at the end of the day, Sonny Bill Williams' red card did not mean Bowden Barrett didn't still have the chance to win us that second test. Bowden Barrett attempted 10 shots at goal, I believe. I've got a screenshot up here right now. But he didn't manage to get all of them. He only kicked 7 of them. And so because Bodie missed just one extra kick, the Lions were able to win by only a few points in the last 10 minutes. Owen Farrell kicked all of their goals that day, and in the second tests, he didn't miss any either. In the last 10 minutes of the game, he also made a great turnover after tackling Israel Dagg, and then went on to kick the final penalty of that test from 50 metres. At the end of the day, New Zealand fans can't blame the ref. It's divisive, it puts a lot of fans off our game, and it gives a lot of young people the wrong impression over what our game's actually like. And actually, at the end of the day, it can cause a lot of overseas fans to despise the All Blacks based on the behaviour of All Black fans, but I'll digress here because this channel was built on support for the team and support for the fan base. Now, those errors that were exposed in our play from 2016 and 2017, such as our lack of depth at lock and our lack of a decent goal kicker, we just couldn't recover from that. I'll add to this as well that Steve Hansen was rather stubborn with his selections. In 2019, he actually got the team selection for the playoffs spot on. Anton Leonard Brown was the best man for 12. Jack Goodhue was the best man for 13. He was good to pick Sonny Bill Williams off the bench because you want to pick your first choice team at a World Cup, but then behind them, you don't want all these people who are going to light the tournament up. I know it's nice for the highlight reels, but actually the guys who are going to win you the games are experienced players. So Sonny Bill Williams, having played 50 tests, was the best man to come off the bench because although he wasn't a first choice player by that stage, he was still a calm old mind who could come off and close out the game very well. So what you want to do as a coach is you want to get experience into these players at a young age. You want 23 year olds to have played 20 something tests. You want to start capping players at 21. Don't be afraid to give these young guys a go. This is to all future test coaches who might end up watching this video, goodness knows how if you do. Like Richie Mwanga, he was the first choice first five and no dispute, he should have been there. But Richie just did not have the experience to deal with a, a vicious, ferocious defence from England. Anton Leonard Brown did not have a reference point for a dominant team like this. Maro Itoje, Jamie George, Sam Underhill, Tom Curry, they were just magnificent over the ball. They could make so many turnovers and instead of going with more jackling options, Shag instead with went with a bigger line out because going with a bigger line out could really drown out the lack of height that England had and that was a very good choice he just forgot to train them on the breakdown because in actual reality Sam Kane and Artie Savia were the only real jackling options that we had George Bridge and Severis were also exposed for their lack of experience I know it's nice to have a bolter that people aren't going to expect to be in your team going into a World Cup, but I think the whole bolter for every World Cup actually needs to go, unless somebody's injured. Because with having a bolter, they're not tried and tested, and England really made the effort of targeting Severis. Although he was the best 14 in the country, he just could not deal with all that kicking. The problem is that within 2017, 2018, Steve Hansen did not learn from the fact that Bowden Barrett was not up to international standards as a goal kicker. He did not learn from the fact that Ryan Crotty was not good enough to play in the playoffs of the World Cup in 2019. He did not learn that Brody Retallick's injuries were going to hamper him. He did not learn that Artie Savia needed to be starting and was far superior than any of the options he put out there at six. He did not learn that Scott Barrett was best off the bench. He did not learn 
that you need a big winger at 11. Yes, George Bridge was the best, but he did not fit into the game plan. And that was what eventually led to New Zealand Rugby's demise at the 2019 World Cup. The All Blacks just could not handle all of the stuff because simply put, their coach did not make the effort to counteract England's tactics. Over the years, Steve Hansen was the kind of coach who really wanted the All Blacks to practice their strengths, to continue to improve them, but also pay just a wee bit of, you know, attention to the weaknesses they could have. For example, Damian McKenzie's tackling. Steve Hansen did not handle a lot of things well, and I'm not going to blame him for the defeat, because I'm also going to blame the players for not adapting to the way England played. There were a lot of tactics England used that the players just could not identify. This kick you're seeing right here that Richie Mwanga tried was designed to catch out South Africa, but because he wasn't experienced enough to handle England, he just tried it anyway. In 2018, Hansen also mucked around a lot with the front row. He really did not know who his first choice front row was. He didn't know who his first choice hooker was. And experience in young guys is everything. You can't just bring out the old boys club on their last legs. You've got to give experience to young, fresh players. Look at Anton Leonard Brown by 25. He's, earned, he's played 50 tests nearly. He's on 49 right now. But by that stage, far too many of them were off the bench. In 2016 as well, Steve Hansen was continuing to use quite a few old players who would never make it to the World Cup. He continues to use Jerome Kano. He didn't really give Elliot Dixon too much of a chance. He recalled Stephen Luatua, even though Luatua was heading off to England to play, for, to play for Bristol, who he now captains. Steve Hansen made a lot of mistakes, and New Zealand rugby should have realised that actually World Cup cycles aren't four years, they're six years. And we need to give a coach six years preparation for a World Cup. So what they should have done was scrap 2019, use Scott Robertson as a fresh blood who could possibly win 2019, but then absolutely crush it in 2023. Scott Robertson has been hard done by by New Zealand rugby. So hopefully they learn to correct their mistake of taking continuity too far. They start to stop promoting from within and find a new group to use that they can promote from within. Scrap the current one out with the old, in with the new. And hopefully coaches who are taking over the All Blacks in the future remember to learn from their mistakes, unlike Steve Hansen. And hopefully future All Blacks study games of the past, study their opposition, and study how they play as well study their coaching even, because players do not want to repeat the same mistakes as previous players either. That's what went wrong for New Zealand rugby between 2015 and 2019, and it's your boy Max signing out.